this class has received uh, from Mark's messages and Luke and then uh, Dr. Peter Lilback, uh, Ezekiel 17, and then Greg Beal, Dr. Greg Beal, uh, in Isaiah 6. Uh, you cannot appreciate uh, how difficult those passages are because they're visions in uh, Ezekiel 17 and Isaiah 6. And so uh, you have to understand the vision and then you have to teach the vision. And so your interpretation has to line up with your application to it. Very difficult uh, thing. It reminded me of Dr. Johnson telling us students, uh, if you want to be uh, good preachers, teach the hard texts, uh, the difficult interpretations. I've tried to do that, and uh, I'm still trying to do that. Uh, but it, that's, you just don't realize uh, the fabulous opportunity you're afforded at Believer's Chapel to have the great teaching that you've been given recently. Okay, uh, we are in Proverbs chapter 21, and this morning we begin in verse 3. I actually had this going from 3 to 8, and then I thought to myself in a sober, mo in, in a sober moment, who am I kidding? Uh, so we'll just, we'll go from 3 to 7 this morning. Uh, to do righteousness and justice is more desirable to the Lord than sacrifice. 21.4, a haughty look, a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked produce sin. Five, the plans of the diligent lead to progress, or you might have profit, but everyone who hastens, that's a very important word, hastens, comes only to lack. Here's six. The acquisition of treasuries by a lying tongue is a windblown breath of those seeking death. Seven, and our last for this morning, the violence of the wicked drag them away because they refuse to do justice. Now, I want you to notice there at the second line of that proverb, notice we have the absence of the divine prerogative. So it's just left open-ended and we have to supply that by wisdom, how this wickedness is going to be handled or taken care of. And that is really essential to understanding the uh, proverb itself. Okay, here's the way I'm going to teach these, and I'm going to go very slow. I was admonished this morning because I don't go slow enough for you to write these down. Uh, 21.3, the wise focus is on the daily walk. The wise focus is on the daily walk. 21.4, the look, the lamp, expressions of wickedness that highlight the grace of God. The look, the lamp, expressions of wickedness that highlight the grace of God. Here is five. Wisdom keeps to the day what the Lord has provided. Wisdom keeps to the day what the Lord has provided. Six. The life and energy of driven vapor. 
the life and energy of driven vapor. Seven, wisdom deals with wickedness quickly and directly. Wisdom deals with wickedness quickly and directly. Okay, so we've got five or six Proverbs this morning, and here is our exposition beginning in 21.3. To do righteousness and justice. It's a better than proverb, you'll see. The opening of this top line, to do, it's the idea of deciding. Will I put into action righteousness and justice as a daily walk? And remember what that would be. That is disadvantaging oneself to advantage others and conducting my affairs that way. Or... Will I conform my affairs to the things that involve me only? Do I commit my life daily to the Lord or do I live for myself? That's really the issue here in the proverb. Line one and now line two is to the Lord than sacrifices. And here is the comparison. It's the good that sacrifices to the Lord, an act of fealty, worship, we would say ceremony, but it really doesn't change your life, does it? It's just ceremony. Uh, and that's really not the issue. That's why we at Believer's Chapel have very little ceremony, and uh, I think that's rather significant. I always have remembered back the things that my father would say to me, uh, because he walked through the doors of Believer's Chapel back in the 70s as a pagan, and he said to me, it's amazing to me to go to a church where people carry their Bibles. You see, he was used to ceremony. He was used to a flowing ceremony, and that was worship. But we don't do that here at Believer's Chapel. We're not given to ceremony. We practice the ordinances that the Lord has given us uh, as he spells out you know, through the apostles, and we practice those things. But we're not given to ceremony. Ceremony doesn't change lives. Um, it provoked my thinking, this idea of sacrifices. It provoked my thinking to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11, where the Apostle Paul says, we're not unaware of the schemes of the devil. Well, what are the schemes of the devil? Well, here they are. The enemy of your soul. He loves religious ceremony. Remember, he was one of the most beautiful of all the creatures. That's uh, part of him. It's his emanation. So when I listen to his choirs sing on occasion, well, they're magnificent, fabulous music. And think of his houses of worship, the architecture. It appeals all to the senses, doesn't it? Majestic porches. Lofty columns, vaulted roofs, gilded altars, and they're dressed, his ambassadors, they're dressed so colorfully. And always with the idea in mind that they're different than us, they're separate than us, they're holy, and they take us to a holy place and lead us. Altars, crosses, incense, stirring conal gates, crowned with an angel of gold. Wow, that's our neighbor. 
We look at a place like that and we say, my, God must be in there somewhere. It all appeals to the senses. But what do we do? We study the scriptures because it is through the scriptures and the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit that lives are actually changed. And that is the emphasis here in the proverb. Not ceremony. The scriptures always put the person's conduct above religious ceremony. And that's taught over and over throughout the scriptures. But probably the normative text for that in the Old Testament is 1 Samuel 15, 22, where the prophet Samuel rebuked the king. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6, God says, I, devi- I desire covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty, hesed, steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Personal righteousness trumps everything in the scriptures. It was the Protestant Reformation and their emphasis that daily righteousness should be practiced by everyone. And that was all against the corruption of the ceremony of the Roman church. The question of that age, do I need a priest and ceremony for the forgiveness of sins? And the reformers said, absolutely not. And they gave us the priesthood of the believer that we in our own hearts, in the quietness of those hearts, we appeal to our great priest who makes intercession for us. I thought it was striking that David Horwitz, the brilliant Jewish writer and thinker, called the Reformation principle of the priesthood of the believer, the greatest single transformative idea to freedom that the world has ever known. Unfortunately, this very good man, who I respect a lot, is still looking for his Messiah. We need to pray for him in that regard. And in the New Testament, Jesus quoting the law, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 7, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Of course, in the New Testament, we have the cancellation of much of the Old Testament worship because with the Spirit's presence in the believer, it is the heart that is the issue. And it is the word of God speaking to that heart that conforms us to Christ. Not ceremony. It's the word. And that's the proverb. Here's 21.4, a haughty look and a proud, arrogant, even audacious heart. The lamp of the wicked produce sin. We've already seen this word haughty before. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17, haughty eyes, lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. The idea is that the eyes by the haughty heart look down on other people. They have elevated view of themselves. Interesting, this word pride. It's literally the word wide, Uh, a heart that is wide. Now, I'm going to give you a text, and you're going to recognize this word instantly. It's Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8. The Lord tells Moses, I've come down to deliver my people out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good, and here's our word, pride, only it's translated differently because it means something differently. It's literally the word 
wide. And we don't have an English equivalent to this word. That's what makes it so difficult. Wide, broad. But if you will meditate on it, you begin to see that the word pride really comes into focus. Uberto Casuto wrote a fabulous commentary on the book of Exodus. And he talks about this word in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8. Broad, but it's more than that. Remember, it's, I'm going to take you to this broad land. And then there is the Bedouin phrase. That's what he called it. Loaded with milk and honey. So it had not only this idea of a broad aspect, but it also had content to it. So we think of this word as something that is dense, something that is loaded with things. Milk and honey, that's the word. Now, because there's no English equivalent, we have to think through, and here it is. The idea is pride is unrestrained, broad, and yet loaded. Broad, we would say the proud heart is the unrestrained heart. We would say the proud heart is the heart that's loaded with many, many things. That's the idea. Dense, thick, many things. Well, we understand that because we hear somebody and we say to ourselves, well, that person's full of himself. See, that's the idea. There's a lot of content in his unrestrained behavior or his conversation. That's why John Calvin called pride the doorway to all sin. This is what leads you to everything because there's lots of content in what makes you a prideful person. Here is the wise walk for us. Psalm 131, O Lord, my heart is not proud. There's our word. My eyes are not haughty. True wisdom, the skill for living, says Micah, is to walk humbly with our God. And so here it is, line two. The lamp, it's an image. It's an image for a person. The lamp is a person. And Jesus picked up on that in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he says, if your light is hidden under a basket, who can see it? So what are we to do? We are to let our light shine before others that they may see our good works and bring glory to God the Father. That's line two, the lamp. It's an image. Image of an individual which in the Proverbs here is perverted by sin. You see that? His life is the product of of sin. I can recall a conversation that I had with Dr. Johnson, and we were talking about the doctrine of sanctification, a long conversation, but he summarized it in a way that was very striking to me. He said, look, our lives can ultimately be reduced down to one word, sin. Never thought about that. I remember it made such an impression upon me. But see, that's really the truth. We're wicked from top to bottom. And yet, that brings great honor to the Lord Jesus Christ who saved us, doesn't it? I mean, our lives of sin, that's that velvet black cushion that they laid the jewel upon. They don't leave it out there on the glass. That doesn't bring it to the fore. 
But you put that black velvet underneath it, now it comes to life, it shines. That's the idea. Look, we have all been dug from some horrible pit, someplace, somewhere, and we've all been loaded with pride and arrogance. But God, in his grace and mercy, has saved our souls. And we now are the lamp that reflects his glory. That's the proverb. Here's five. The plans of the diligent lead only to profit. But everyone who hastens comes only to lack. We actually... We'll see this word to lack again, 28, 27, and 30 years from now when we're all studying the book of Proverbs. We'll get there and we'll study this word all over again. The proverb here teaches the consequences of two courses of action. The contrast, line one, is the diligent, that's the ant, Proverb 6. And line two, this word hastens. Interesting word. The opening of the top line, plans, it's really translated thoughts in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7. The unrighteous man's thoughts or the unrighteous man's plans. Plans and thoughts, one and the same. And then the word diligent literally means sharp, used of a threshing tool that cuts. Here in our top line, we would say the plans of the diligent are clear cut, they are precise, they are accurate. And then our last word here, profit, the gain over what was invested. Now, line two, everyone. That allows no exceptions whatsoever. And here is the important word, hasten implying hasty activity, allowing for no planning and no reflection. Now, I'm going to give you this word, and you're never going to forget it again, because it's a passage and a story that you're all familiar with. It's Genesis chapter 19 and verse 14. It's when the angels came to Lot in Sodom, and they said to him, our word, Now, hasten. Don't reflect on it. Don't meditate on it. Go. That's the idea. So don't walk around your backyard and look at your garden one last time. Don't go down to the city square and take pictures with the family. No, go. Get out of Sodom. That's this word. Genesis 19, 14. So that's the idea that we have of hastens. Now, here in our top line, we would say the plans of the diligent, clear-cut, precise, always gaining, always prospering, line two, everyone, no exceptions, that hastily move along. So we've learned through the pandemic that uh, really, The federal government did something good for a change. Uh, Back years ago, they put in the federal budget money for these respirators. And they dole that out to the states. But what happened to that money? Well, the money hit that account, and those governors snapped it up like a bass on a fishing lake. That money was gone. So the pandemic came, and what happened? We had no respirators. Money had been set aside and budgeted for respirators, but we didn't have any. And so what did the governors do? Well, they blamed everybody else, remember? That's foolishness. But look, the end of their haste, the end product was lack. Nothing. That's what they got for being hasty and not 
working with what they had been given that day in wisdom. Contrary to expectations, haste proves what fools they really were, not caring about the life that they were called to exhibit and the responsibility of their office. No. So what about us? Well, here it is. It's Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. I love this word in the King James. Circumspectly. Love that word. And the apostle tells us that our job is to walk circumspectly. That is in wise and careful conduct about our day. What has God put into your hands? What responsibilities has he laid before you? That is what you are to do and be God-honoring about it. Never in haste to something else. No, stay and play where he puts you and God will be glorified in your faithfulness. And that's the idea of the proverb. Here's six, the acquisition of treasures by a lying tongue is a wind-blown breath of those seeking death. The acquisition of wealth by hard work is a sign of God's blessing in the Proverbs. But fraudulent pursuit of assets by a lying tongue is consistently condemned. It's fools. It's fools' lips and fools' language. And so it's condemned in all forms of falsehood, no matter how it's represented. So the hasty fool of verse 5 is now trying to prosper, trying to advance by using deceptive speech. And here is our word acquisition from the verb to make or to do. It's nefarious activity assigned with what he is making or doing. Treasuries here. Back then it was silver, gold like it is today, but costly utensils as well. Remember they had an advanced bartering system. Gains by means of falsehood. That would be a lying tongue. One of the six things that the Lord hates and we're back to our original passage in Proverbs chapter 6 with haughty eyes and then the lying tongue. They go together because the lying tongue is the expression of the heart and the haughtiness of the heart. But, says our proverb, those who falsify facts to fill their bank accounts will soon learn that their speech is as transitory as they themselves. Boy, could I tell you some stories about the oil business in regards to this. But look how it's described. Two figures here in the proverb. The first is windblown, line two. Psalm 1, verse 4. The wicked are like the chaff, windblown. There it is. And here's the second image or figure, breath here, transitory, like the breath that you have in front of your face on a cold morning. As soon as you recognize it, it's gone, fleeting. That's what deceptive treasures are like and the breath that seeks them out to find them, gone. Now, final words, look at this. Those seeking death. The folly of the fool, according to the proverb, is fooled. He's the one that's really fooled. He uses deceptive speech to fool, but he's the one that's actually fooled. Those seeking death. Once again, the folly of the fool is fooled. Thinking that treasures will bring him one thing 
only to find that they bring something entirely different than what he expected. And what is that? Death. Death. The practice of deception is the straight way to the funeral home, according to the proverb. Now, go back and look at these closing words again, because I really think they need some emphasis here. Those seeking death. You know, nobody seeks death. Really? But you see, that's where the fool is fooled. Little does he know that his activity is all tied up in an abundance of energy, planning, and it's going to take him to death. Then think like that. He can't connect those dots. That's why the Word of God is so perceptive to us, because we see what wisdom is really saying to us all. The folly of fools is deception, and it leads to death. And that is what he's laboring for, and he doesn't even know it. The power of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom, and fools despise wisdom and discipline. Here's seven in our last proverb. I've been running over so uh, in the last few times, so I'm real proud of myself today. I'm going to get out on time. Uh, verse seven: The violence of wicked people drags them. Now, there's an interpretive question here: Who's the them? The violence of wicked people drags them away because they refuse to do justice. Uh, here is a current proposition in this proverb for our day. Wicked people do not act with justice. Now, we need to understand what justice is and the way it's being used here. Thus, they bring harm to innocent people. Wisdom declares their future will be a tragic end, just like we've had before watching these fools. Deceptive language, uh, seeking money rather than faithfulness, etc. So here is their tragic end. Look, line one opens violence. Now that's destruction, that's havoc, that is those who would endanger our society by their acts. We learned early in Proverbs chapter 2 that the Lord stores up victories for the righteous. And interestingly enough, Amos, the prophet, uses that same word, stores up, in chapter 3 in verse 10. Only he assigns that word to the wicked and not the righteous. It's the wicked who are storing up, treasuring up violence. Then, in their plot, in their plan, it is unleashed upon society. Random acts bring death or devastation. So it was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and I pulled into the Kerr-McGee parking lot in downtown Oklahoma City. It's four levels. And I saw a spot there right on the corner, an empty place to park on the second floor. And I pulled in, and I reached for the keys. And as I was pulling them out of the ignition, Suddenly, I was thrust up against or in the direction of my steering wheel. And the first thought I had is, somebody just rear-ended me. 
I'm in a parking garage in a stall and somebody just rear-ended me. And then I jumped out of the car and there was no one behind me. And I said, that's a bomb. Timothy McVeigh, a nobody, he drove a truck loaded with fertilizer, which was like a bomb when it's detonated properly, and he knew how to do it. He drove that truck right in front of the federal building. And then, like the coward that he was, he jumped out of the truck and ran down the alley and away. And that truck exploded and took the whole face off that four-story building. You know, they recovered black and white videotape. There were people actually standing on the sidewalk in front of that building, but they found no DNA evidence of them at all amidst the rubble and the chaos, they just vanished. Um, they were able to track who the people were because they didn't show up at home or they didn't show up at work. And so they posthumously assigned names and places and faces to who those individuals were, but they found nothing of them, no human remains whatsoever of those people. Timothy McVeigh didn't realize that where he had parked that truck was 150 feet just north of a daycare center loaded with children. Those children were all gone, every one of them. And I can remember Dr. Johnson was so moved by this tragedy, he wrote me a two-page letter and saying to me that there will be a very special place in hell for someone that does such a deed to children. Never forget that. But you see, that's what we're talking about here in the proverb. It's random acts that bring death and devastation. And so that is the them of our proverb drags them away. And who is the them? It's the victims, the innocent people. It's the picture or an image of dragging fishnets. The free swimming fish are caught or captured suddenly in nets. And that's these demented individuals their plot, their plan. It came to fruition and it was successful. That's the idea here. But line two declares their fate. Here it is. They refuse to do justice. Now let's look at that word refuse for a moment. It's found in Genesis 37, 35, Jacob refused, that's our word, to be comforted by his sons and daughters because, you see, they had brought him that shredded, multicolored coat dipped in blood. And so they tried to comfort him, thinking that his son was dead. But he refused, that's our word. So it's really a state of mind, isn't it? It's a state of reason. And so that is the violent. That's what they do. They're such demons. Their state of mind is thrive on wicked acts. That's what the, the proverb is saying. Now look at this word justice because it puts the proverb in real perspective. Justice here is the social order of things. 
This proverb doesn't paint a very lovely or attractive picture of the criminal at all. His demented mind who does this violent. No, but here's of something of significance. The proverb doesn't tell us God's means of dealing with this person with random acts of violence. Doesn't tell us anything at all in the proverb. So now we have to be assured, knowing our God, that He will create the means for bringing about that justice. Now, here's what I found interesting. The Cambridge scholar Derek Kidner has written a commentary. It's a fabulous commentary on Proverbs. But it's very short, just very short, little terse words, phrases, and sentences. And he references here to this proverb, Shechem. Now that startled me. You know the story of Shechem. Uh, Jacob had... Uh, crossed over back into the land. He met his brother Esau, and then he again deceived him, and he went up into the land. And then, I, I love Dan's sermon on this text. He says Jacob was drifting. He was just drifting around. And that's what got him into trouble. That's what got the family into trouble. Instead of going on about his business and doing where, what he should have been doing, when he should have been doing, he's drifting around. And now they come to Shechem. And this son, Shechem, rapes Deborah, the daughter of Jacob. Now... The brothers want justice. They want something dealt with quickly and punitively and effectively for what had been done. But he comes in and he says, no, I'm going to marry her. Well, the brothers are going to have none of that. What do they do? They murder the whole place. That's what they do. So it's this... Horrible story of blood upon blood upon blood, rape, murder, all because Jacob wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was drifting along. That's the point of the sermon, a great sermon. You need to hear it. But that's this word justice here. And that was the reference that this Cambridge scholar made to this proverb. It was ugly. It was bloody. It was horrible. But it was justice. It was justice. God moves in mysterious ways. But you never count him out. Invisible, yes. But he has a way. And he has a people. And he has a motive to deal with wickedness. And this is it. Justice. That's what he does. That's not our job. Our job is to walk in the light. Our job is to count others better than ourselves. Our job is to be wise, to be careful, walk circumspectly. But God, in His providence, in His divine sovereignty, is a God of justice, and He will deal with the wicked. And that's the proverb. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. And thank you for your people that gather here at Believer's Chapel. Not for ceremony. They're here 
to learn the Scriptures because the Scriptures produce the faithful life in the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're about here in this place. Bless these people. Prosper the Word of God. The elders that serve. The deacons that serve. Thank you for creating this place. And may it always glorify you through the Word. In Jesus' name, amen.